Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Together, we'll explore practical tips, expert advice, and inspiring stories to help you overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Making small changes is possible and can lead to big results. Are you ready? Let's go do this. It's great. Dustin, I think this is this can be one epic conversation, that's for sure. So I am very excited about everything that we're going to dive into. And you know what, I love to let my guests just introduce themselves and give that little background and we'll bounce from there. So awesome. Take yeah, it. Well, thanks for having me, Sue. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And as we were pre recording, we know a lot of the same people. And we it, it's, a, it's funny how these entrepreneurial circles are, are very small circles in many ways. So yeah, my name's Dustin Reekman, been married 23 years, have three kids. That's a, a big part of my identity and, and what I what, what drives me. And then in my entrepreneurial journey, which I'm sure we'll unpack my my current focus is a company called seven figure leap where we help mission-driven entrepreneurs grow seven-figure brands by telling their story. And so a big part of how we do that is what I'm doing today, which is podcast guesting. For about 16 years, I had an engineering career. So I have two degrees in civil engineering and got into the specialty of traffic engineering and was building and leading teams doing that and just basically got burned out of it and just felt like I kind of hit, hit what I could do there. And so in the past, in the last seven years of that career, I was also doing online side hustles basically. So in 2009, I created a, a website called engaged marriage, which grew out of marriage ministry that my wife and I were involved in, in our church. And so just like, man, this needs to be online. It was like the heyday of blogging. I just got on there, learned how to create a website, started writing, ended up writing a book and doing speaking. And that really pulled me deeper into the world of digital marketing to grow that business. So around 2015, I really got deep into digital marketing and kind of declared unofficially that I want to eventually leave engineering and do this full time, but I wasn't ready to do that. My wife was a stay at home mom at that time to three kids and I had all the, all the breadwinning and all the insurance and all that stuff. But what I did start to do is take on freelance clients. So for a couple year period there, I was engineering, engaged marriage and taking on marketing clients to kind of build the, yeah, the war chest to be able to make this, this full leap. So I made the full leap at the end of 2017 and was just living life and had a bunch of different marketing clients, still had engaged marriage running, ended up meeting someone as a, who was a local butcher who owned the butcher shops that I was helping to market locally. And then he said, Hey, do you know how to sell stuff online? And I said, <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I think we so. ended up forming a partnership in a company called Fire Creek Snacks which brought me into the world of like e-commerce and going to trade shows and learning brick and mortar and all the, all the different things that that entails. So it really made me much more well-rounded in my entrepreneurial acumen. So I was doing that for a couple of years. And then this little thing called COVID happened in 2020 and rocked my world in a really big way. I was actually driving to a trade show for Fire Creek Snacks and it was canceled. And then when I got home, I lost about 80% of my revenue from my marketing clients because they were like, my dentist, my real estate broker, a restaurant. They're like local clients that were all shut down in the state of Illinois for an extended oh, wow. period of time. Wow. Yeah. I know my wife and kids were all home because my wife had just taken a new position and went back to work as a special ed teacher. So that was that was a saving grace. But but all they're all home. I couldn't leave. I didn't know what the heck I was gonna do. We were we were really on a roll with this with this marketing that we were doing for Fire Creek. And I thought there's gotta be a way to do this from home. And that's what pulled me into podcast guesting for myself. So podcast guesting became a part of what I was doing in 2020. I started doing that a lot and got a lot of, had a lot of success with it and growing that brand. Then by 2021, people started to notice and say, can you help me with that? So I kind of got pulled into the world of coaching without intending to. <laughs> and then I did a bunch of one-on-one -on -one coaching engagements, found out I really loved it. And then in 2022, that evolved into small groups. And then that eventually evolved into a more full mastermind experience, which is really what I do now is I lead smaller groups of entrepreneurs who are basically going from six to seven figures in their business. And I help them create, co-create a podcast guesting system to fuel that growth. So that, that has the engineering, marriage, marketing, meat sticks, and now masterminds. <laughs> I love it. Isn't it funny though, that number one, a lot of entrepreneurs that I talk to, and probably you would agree as well, that they almost stumbled into the business that they create and filling a need. 
you know, yes. you create it out of that. And, and people like organically come to you when you don't realize that you're good at something, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's really, you know, it, yeah. people, I get that question sometimes, like, why did you go to engineering school? And now you're like, what do you do? Like, no, one, yeah. it was like, yeah, but like, isn't well, there a common thread in engineering? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. I mean, the, yeah, yeah. It's like, all problem solving. And like, for me, even when I've helped people with marketing or selling a meat stick to a retailer, like what I'm trying to do is solve a problem for them. Right. And so that's how I position everything. That's, you know, how I create the messaging. And so even when I look back at my engineering career, it was while I always worked for someone else, I was a partner in both the firms I worked for at, at some point in, in both of those engagements. So, so it was a little bit entrepreneurial, but the thing that really, when I, when I said burnt out, it really wasn't so much that I didn't like what I was doing. It was like, there's got to be a more direct way to scratch this entrepreneurial itch than like mm -hmm. doing this all for 50 hours a week and then having three other side businesses. Like how can I, how can I really focus in and create the most impact? I started to realize that this entrepreneurial itch was actually, it was my purpose. It was like part of my purpose, right? There was a mission behind it. And I got so much fulfillment when I got to work with an entrepreneur and grow the, help them grow their business. I was like, that feels just way more empowering to me than solving traffic problems. And, you know, traffic problems were a great thing to solve. And I feel like I did a lot of good work and improved safety and all that stuff. But yeah, it's kind of like yeah. you said, if kind of incrementally, it seems ac accidental. And then you look back at these dots and I can very much see the through line and I'm very grateful that I had the courage at each of those kind of intersections to be like, I'm going to try this and I'm going to like pursue this opportunity. Maybe sometimes too many opportunities at once, but you know, it turned out, it's turned out really well for me. So you said like you saw those, those opportunities that were there, would you consider yourself a risk taker or would you consider yourself risk adverse? I would say I am not afraid to take a risk, but I am very, I do it in a conservative way. So probably a really good example of that would be making this transition from full-time engineer to full-time entrepreneur. That took me like two and a two over two years. Right. So it wasn't like I just said, screw it. I'm quitting my job and yeah. I'll figure it out. Like I'm definitely not that, you know, it was initially a slow build and there was a point where it became much more rapid. So for a couple yeah. of years, I was like, taking on these clients and kind of testing the water and figuring out what to charge and what am I actually good at? Cause I was doing everything like websites and emails and Facebook ads and Google, my business profiles, like and coming up with like bundles of the month for meat for the butcher shop, like anything I, I, I could, I was trying to be a chameleon Jack of all trades. Yeah. So, but there was a, a moment in like this epiphany moment. And so it was summer 2017 and I had just basically just been, I've been making progress, but it was like, oh my gosh, I cannot, I can't do this another two years, right? I'm working a more than full-time job and I have, you know, a huge roster of clients and I'm, I'm working all the time and, you know, wanted to see my wife and kids a little, a little bit more, but I was holding on to this engineering security blanket, right? Because it was, and I, it was wise to do so. That's what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is I was going to take the risk, but I was like pretty hard for me to let go of, of that. And at some point I realized like, oh my gosh, I can just try it. I can like go try this entrepreneurial thing for three months, six months. And then if I'm not good at it, or I don't like it. I can just go get another engineering job because I'm not losing my career because I'm bad at it. I'm choosing to try something different. And when I let go of thinking it was a permanent decision, it really freed me up. And then I went to my wife and, and my kids. And I'm like, Hey, I know I work a lot now. I'm giving myself to the end of the year. I've got a financial goal of how much I want to have saved so that I can make this transition wisely. And if I hit that goal, I'm quitting my job. And if I don't hit that goal, I'm going to have to set a different goal. I basically had two more than full-time jobs for that six month period was able to hit the goal though. And then had that freedom to then quit the engineering career, some risk adversity, but you know, ultimately I did make the leap, which most people don't do. So, well, like you said, you built in the background, that's number one. And number two, you gave yourself a goal, a measurable goal. You, if you either hit it or you don't. <laughs> so I went to quit. Two things happened the day I was, so I was really scared. I'd been with this one company for eight years. I built I've, they've kind of hired me on to build this entire practice within a larger engineering firm. So I was like, I had hired every person that was ever in the group and I was leading the group and I was responsible for the business development. And so it was like, this is scary for me to come. And I felt like it was going to come out of nowhere. Like never. Did you tell it. them, did they know you were leaving or did you just show up one day and say, I mean, no, they didn't know yeah. I was leaving. And so I, I 
you know, they probably got the clue when over Christmas, I'm like, I'd really like to meet with you, you know, on January 2nd. <laughs> and so I, I met with my branch manager, my immediate supervisor. And I was just, I told him it's not you, it's me. Like that's something I've been developing on the side and I'm just, I, I need a break from engineering. I'm not going to go to a competitor. You don't have to worry about me doing anything with clients, you know? And his response was like, really happy for you. I'm the president of the engineers club. We need a new website. Would you like to build it? And so he gave me a project because I was, you know, at that time I was doing random marketing stuff yeah. and I was like, yeah. So he gave me this wonderful relationship. And then, then yeah, like, then they said, yes, we'll obviously you can quit if you'd like, but let us digest this. And they got back to me just like a couple of days later and said, how would you like it if we just paid you a substantial hourly rate will lo you'll lose your benefits because you're not going to be full time and just right. work part time and you'll help us make this transition and find your replacement. And it's like, great. So I, yeah, so I actually freed up most of my time, got paid more per hour, got a new project out of it. Yeah. And it's just, but right. it's like by taking that, by being honorable to the relationship and, mm -hmm. and thoughtful about you know, the stuff I said I would do for them. I think I said like, I'll stay for like three months. I know this is gonna be a transition and, you know, but obviously I'll leave today if that's, if you guys are, you know, want that, but I, I think it would, I just handled the relationship the right way and turned out like a win, total win-win for, for both sides. Do you find that sometimes if you just let things go rather than trying to control the situation that it, it flows? in a way that you didn't expect, but it winds up being good in the end. Yes, but I'm really bad at it. So <laughs> I believe it, but practicing it is tough for me. One of the best books I've ever read is called The Surrender Experiment by mm -hmm. Michael Singer. And he talks about in that book, just that surrendering to the flow of life. And it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's pretty hard when you want to control the outcome, control the situation, but the surrender comes in at it in the surrender. It, it's not talking about just do nothing and yeah. sit back and somebody's going to put money in your bank account. It's about doing what you're supposed to do, what you feel called to do, but then allowing your life to take a left turn or a right turn and be okay with it. You know? Yeah. There's a couple, I have a couple experiences with this and thoughts and, you know, being a Christian, part of my struggle with that is like having the faith that things are going to work out. Right. Yeah. So, and I've read this book called, called Rise, <laughs> Rise and Go from a guy named Corey Carlson. It's amazing. And it really met me in a place uh, a couple summers ago where I was in another period of transition. And one of my big takeaways, which there's a quote that's, you know, pretty common, let go and let God. I think that was, that's helpful. And then the one that really made it practical to me was that God has the night shift. And this idea that I can work all day and doing the thing I need to do. But then at some point I got to like leave my office, turn off my computer and then let, you know, let God take care of the night shift. And like, I don't, I can't control it all anyway. So there's really no point in like worrying about things all the time. So I think in a spiritual way, that's been, that's helpful. That's a mantra I try to live by. And then just really practically, it's kind of a, a funny thing. My coach observed is, you know, my current business model is cohort based. So I'll fill up a group of entrepreneurs, you know, 12 entrepreneurs in a mastermind group, and we work together for 90 days. So with that, the cycle of that, you know, a group gets filled and then, you know, then you got to fill the next one and the next one, and you, there's some space in there, but inevitably I'll get to some point where the program's approaching and I'll have like five spots left and I'll just, my default response is just like follow up with every lead or, you know, like check in with my salesperson and just like try to like control who gets those last five spots and, and push it. Mm -hmm. And what my coaches observe, she's like, you know, every time when you get to this point where you're kind of starting to get a little stressed, if you go, whenever you like go work on a house project or you go golfing with your daughter, like you just completely let go of it. Like people just flood in and fill the last spots. I'm like, that's actually true. So yeah. I, yeah it's, there's it's that like, surrender. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like just letting just it go. Quit worrying about it. Like it, just yeah. have faith that it's going to, whoever needs to be in there is going to find it. They're going to be there. You've done the work to generate the leads. And at some point you can't ultimately control, you know, what happens yeah. at the end of the, at the end of the process. So, yeah, there are a ton of unknowns and you have to be okay with the unknown. Okay. With, you don't know what's coming next. Some people love that, you know, and other people are like, ah, I don't want to do that. You know, and some people aren't like, meant, some people aren't meant to be entrepreneurs either. Yeah. I'm like, know? my wife would never be in a million years want to be an entrepreneur, you know, so she <laughs> very risk averse, but now she, she see, she understands the fulfillment, the financial reward, you know, now I've got this figured out and it's working really well it's way better than engineering, but she always supported me and always said she believed in me and had faith in me, but yeah, 
whenever I was the sole breadwinner and I said I'm quitting my job yeah. in six months, like that 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 wasn't yeah, a yeah. conversation. Yeah, that could be a little that could be a little unnerving there. But yeah. like we talked about before, you had built up a runway as well. And it, you could always go back. It, it makes me think of uh, Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week, where he talks about people wanting to quit their jobs and then you write out the fears and then you write out the well, what's the worst case scenario that can happen? And then you work into each of those. Well, if this bad thing happens, well, what can you do about it? You know, isn't that really what life is? It's just problem solving. Everything is figure outable. That quote hit me because I didn't really, it wasn't part of my thought process or repertoire that, yeah, wait a minute, I can figure that thing out. And when you make that mindset shift to realizing that there are opportunities and problems, but also, every problem, you can figure out something, some solution to solve it. It just, I don't know. I don't know. For me, it just kind of doesn't make things seem so bad if you know yeah. you can figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, there's somebody out there who can figure it out. Hey, yeah. going back to your situation where you have to find those five more clients and then your coach said, hey, why don't you just go play, play some golf or work on the house? Uh, it's going from grinding mm -hmm. to flow, yes. right? So what are your thoughts on grinding, grinding it out and building things? Because you've built quite a few companies versus flowing into it. How do you view it now? It's definitely matured. So I felt like I've done almost everything the hard way, you know, for my, for kind of my whole life. And we don't have to get back in my whole family of origin story. But came up, the way to summarize is I came from a very poverty, po po impoverished mindset. So a very... Uh, scarcity, lack, impoverished, impoverishment, like whatever. And then I, you know, through a lot of the things we talked about, this process of a big part of my personal development has been through these career and, and business changes. And so I think where I'm sitting today, like my most recent business is Seven Figure Leap. It, I literally, my coaching business had a, a literal 10X leap, like it went 10X in a year. And so how does that happen? Well, it was definitely from a place of flow and abundance. And but I still think that there is, there are practical things you can do to influence that. And so my new podcast, which is called Seven Figure Leap, one the thing, the, the intro to it literally says like, make quantum leaps in your business through smart strategies and rich relationships. And to me, that's the shortcut is the relationships. So to me, I, and, and part of that is because I'm a community builder and I love, I lead these mastermind groups and like, I, you know, so like, it's really been important to me personally, but also as I witnessed so many other entrepreneurs from the seat I get to sit in, like that's where the quick insights come from. That's where the referrals or the, the you know, just the, these just new levels of thinking for me that's happened most quickly in community. And so I do feel like you can get into flow state faster with the right who's, with the right mm -hmm. people around you. And that's something I did not have an appreciation for even two years ago. And now it's like, the main thing I deliver for other people. And, and that's been really interesting to kind of like look back at my career and these businesses and how much each one accelerates quicker than the previous. And I'm sure part of that's experience, part of that's, you know, having a network to, to draw from. But I think a lot of it is just being really intentional about investing in coaching strategy or, you know, being a masterminds or leading masterminds and having those rich relationships surround me. I feel like that has just been the ultimate shortcut. So. Oh, cool. What gets you fired up about life now with all that you've created for yourself? I'd say the really, I mean, it's, to me, it's really all about community and relationships. When I look at the areas I feel like I've had big forward leaps in my faith life, it's been in small group communities. And when I look mm -hmm. at how I serve in my regional community, it's in a couple of different key groups, right? And I obviously my businesses led are fed largely by groups. I have an ongoing mastermind I lead that you know, fuels me and like, and that, so that's an, a one hour a week. We have a virtual call that hour, you know, outside of my family time in my business, that hour lights me up more than anything. Right. I'm actually there to serve. Like they're paying me to be there, <laughs> uh, but I come away so energized from that call because I'm getting to spend this kind of like communal time hearing the highs, lows, struggles, the, the real life of the entrepreneur. And I often have things I can speak into that. And then sometimes they're speaking into me, but just knowing that like, wow, look in the course of 18 months, not only do I have like my cohorts, but I've got this group that now is like totally bought into this experience and they show up every week. 
we just met in person for the first time, which is a whole different level of experience. And so I, I'd say what gets me fired up is like, where is this going to be in another three years? Like it's because it's so cool right now. And it's very new in the scheme of things when you think of businesses. So. Yeah. So listening to you talk and listening to your stories, you have a common thread of you love to serve and community. Your business that you built, the Seven Figure Leap, is where you help entrepreneurs grow through telling their stories. Yes. So let's take a small step backwards. How does someone, if they're listening to this going, well, okay, I don't have a story. I have no compelling story. I don't really, you know, I have a business. Maybe they have a business, maybe they don't, but they would say, I don't know what I would talk about. Where would you direct somebody to start? Yeah, a couple, a couple different kind of practical places to start. One would be if they have a business that they've created and they did it on purpose, <laughs> or even if they didn't in some cases, but like I would, part of what I do on my show when I interview entrepreneurs is I, I dig a few layers deep into why they are doing what they do because they could be doing anything. It's like, why are you choosing to build this business? And why are you choosing to work with these clients? And there's almost always, it's, it's part of their value system. They may not have even realized it, but there's some core value that probably was developed in their childhood uh, vacuums. There's something they lacked probably in the early part of their life that they're not fulfilling in others. And they may not even realize that. And then, so tying themselves back to their own origin story of their business is often a big unlock moment. Like, oh yeah, like I do really believe in this. And that is probably why I ended up doing this, even though I didn't do it consciously, right? So that that's a big part of it. And then another topic that could be an entire episode is like unique ability. So unique ability, it's a Dan Sullivan framework, his famous author and strategic coach. Uh, he's been coaching entrepreneurs for decades. And so, and I think he named it, I'm not even sure I give him credit, but you know, it's, it is kind of what it sounds like, like what in Sue is unique and how does that influence not only how you've served your family, how you've raised your kids, how you show up in your community, but how you do your work, right? And that could be in a nine to five, that could be as an entrepreneur. So it's not specific to entrepreneurs, but what is specific to entrepreneurs is your unique ability is really going to be important in your business life because it's you, right? And so, so that's, that's the definition. I'll, I'll kind of pause here and you can ask me follow-ups, but I would love to talk about an experience I had last month that really like blew my mind around this whole concept. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, and you know what? Do you find that people who operate in their superpowers often don't recognize it? You know, yes. and, and I think that's a big struggle, at least for me personally as well, because people have asked me like, what's your superpower? I'm like, I don't know. Yes. You know, that, I don't know what, I don't know where my zone of G in there's a the couple of different words too. A, yes. <laughs> well, what I, what I will say about that is not only is it like sometimes happen, it's almost a hundred percent universal that you cannot name your own superpower, your own unique ability. Hey, like that's to, good to hear. It's a simple analogy. Like you're yeah. sitting in your jar only other people can read your label, right? And so you can't, you really can't do it. And the other thing that people start to realize is once you start getting really good at what you deliver to your clients, if you're a coach, as an example, you can't coach yourself. Like, I feel like I'm a really good coach. I can sit in the mastermind and lead it like the best in, in the world, but I can't do that for myself <laughs> because I'm in my own head and I, I just don't have the objectivity to do it. So, so one way to shortcut it is, or to find it and then to really refine it and, and believe it in a deep way is to have a community speak it to you. Right. And so one, then this is something I just went through. So I've been meeting with this group for about a year, the seven figure leap mastermind. So they're all people that have been through my core 90 day program. And then some people choose after that, like, Hey, I want to keep the party going. I want to keep building my business with this, with this kind of community and they love the mastermind. So we've been meeting virtually many of us for like a year and all of them, at least with me, have been in an intensive 90 day experience before that. So like, I, you know, feel like I really know these people, they really know me. And so what was really interesting though, is like, we decided we're going to meet in person for the first time in Orlando at a, I was speaking at a conference called PodFest, a podcasting conference. So I was like, Hey, whoever can make it, why don't we come to Orlando? I'll get everyone like VIP access. And then I hosted a really cool dinner the night before the event started. But in preparation for that event, like I just all these things started coming up, like kind of through the fourth quarter and into the beginning of the year where people are asking me kind of privately in the group, like, what am I good at? Or like, how do you see it's my unique ability? And part of it is because we we're talking about these frameworks and Dan Sullivan and, you know, what, you know, what's my zone of genius? And it was coming up on the calls quite a bit. Yeah. So what I did was I had everyone had a simple kind of Google form. I had every member, whether they're going to Orlando or not, 
commit to writing in their own form. It could be three words. It could be three paragraphs, but however they want to express it. Like, how do you see this other member's unique ability? And it was really interesting. And so everyone did it independently. Then I was able to assemble those and curate them into a nice document. And then with the people that were in Orlando, I printed, I had it all printed off and I handed it to them as a gift. And I said, Hey, I want you to, actually, I gave it to them before the event. So they'd have time while they were traveling to read through it. And then in the event, our mastermind experience was centered around, okay, Sue, so you've heard from 14 other people, you know, like about your unique ability and how they see it. Like you distill it down now into like the through line, like what's the two to three word summary of why you're, what is your unique ability? And it was amazing. Like people were crying. People are like, I feel seen for the first time in my life. Like, oh my gosh. Things, like, you've given me the words. I, I just, I couldn't get them. And it was amazing. And so just to kind of put a cap on that for me, my, my distillation of all that, cause I got a ton of feedback cause I know I'm the one person that knows everyone deeply. They, it was two things that you do really well, Dustin, you provide people clarity and you provide them connection. And so I was like, that's it. You know, I'm like, I'm a story brand guide. I love messaging. I love naming offers. And like, I, that's like, I love the whole idea of like giving you an insight. Like, yeah. oh, I just kind of blew your mind because it's, and it's kind of intuitive and it's kind of part of, you know, my, my training. And then once we, once we like, I know exactly what I call this thing. And it's like, now I need to connect you to these who's right. Like that's the connection part. Like now I'm going to reach into my network and be like, oh my gosh, now that you have this clarity, you need to know this, this, and this person. And they're going to really help you, you know, expand your vision and, and grow your business. So that was, that's kind of a fresh, a fresh experience. It was extremely powerful for me and obviously, you know, for everyone else involved. And, you know, not everyone has access to that directly, but, you know, if you're in a group, that's an amazing place to get that feedback. You can get it from one individual and it, it's going to be much more helpful than not getting it. And of course you can go to your family and friends too. One, just the, the last thing I'll say on this, cause I thought it was really interesting is I got the raw feedback from everyone and hadn't really processed it. I just had, I had my document and I handed it to my wife and I said, Hey, read through this. Like, what do you think of this? And she's like, I believe that I believe this is how you are in your business, but I don't really see this as how you are at home. And I was like, I kind of hurt a little bit. I was like, huh. Wow. So I read through it though. And as I was distilling it, I realized why it was because the feedback I was, and this is important for people. Like you got to think of the context that people are seeing you. Uh, and so in my context, all of these people were paying me to lead a mastermind. So they're using words like you're a really good facilitator. You're great at curating amazing groups. And like you lead these communities with so much care and like you're really insightful. And, you know, again, my wife believed that I'd deliver that at work, but she, you know, I'm an introvert. Like I, I'm not like going and building communities locally and I'm not, it, it's a really kind of an interesting dichotomy. So I got back from Orlando and I said, Hey, I know you said this wasn't anything like me, but, <laughs> and she was being a little bit joking. She was a little, you know, not, not looking forward to me leaving town the next morning. But, but I said, I, I distilled it down though. It's clarity and connection. And she's like, Oh my gosh, you're amazing at that. Like, you know, like you help our kids with so much clarity. And then like, you're always looking to connect, connect all of our friends with the right people. You're like the guy that everyone knows at church and, so it was like, okay, yeah, clarity and connection, yes. Not necessarily wearing the hat of curator or facilitator. That's yeah. kind of my work expression of that. But I have other expressions of it in different parts of my life. And that's what's really cool about unique ability is it gets applied in different ways. So that was, I know that was like an, an essay on unique ability, but I just had to share that. that. <laughs> no, I think it was great. I love the picture of we are all in our own little jars and we can't see what's on the label, but everybody else can. not I think that's so helpful because in my journey in the last year and a half, people have asked me or I have asked of me, hey, what are your unique abilities? And I'm like, I don't know. And my coach and I, my coach is Austin, Lenny, he and I had, I, I'll never forget this. We had a text back and forth and I was going to a conference. He said, go operate in your greatness. And I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm great at. I don't see it. And his response was when we operate in our greatness and I would equate that to our zone of genius, you know, our unique ability when we're operating there in that you don't see it you mm -hmm. just show up as you but I truly believe now that I started getting more in tune with who I am and through coaching that you can get little glimpses of your greatness 
and it's how you feel on the inside when you show up. Like what you said, what lights you up, yeah. you know, when you're talking about community, when you're connecting those people, that hour that you spend is energizing to you. And I think yeah. that's when we look for those moments, those are the ones where we're, we are operating in our zone of genius, but it is hard to put it into words. And I, and out of your story, what I love is that you are building community these people feel safe inside this community. And then that's what allows them to be free to see the abilities in others around them. And when you don't have that kind of connection, it's really hard to find what that is. I mean, there's tests and stuff out there too, and I've, I've done them, but my challenge is I read them and I go, okay, this is great, but how does this translate into something that I can do practically that I'm actually going to make money off of? Yeah, that's, <laughs> and, that, and I, I mentioned kind of the first part of what we did with the with this mastermind in Orlando, the second, the actual, so we had a really nice dinner and scheduled for three hours. We were there for four and a half. Like it was a really, it was really a powerful, just social experience, experience, but the application side of it was like, great. Like now you distill this down and you express it to everyone. Now let's mastermind around how that's going to, what you're going to do with it to grow your business in 2024. Right. So we got really practical, like, Hey Dustin, if these are your unique abilities, what would you change about your, delivery model or your marketing approach, like, because, you know, how's this apply to your business? And I think for anyone listening to, if you're like, wow, that would be such a gift, but like, I'm not in a mastermind. People don't know me that well. A really simple exercise that one of our members did before I decided to do this together is he sent, and I know, cause I received one of the texts. He just sent like, I don't know, probably 10, maybe 15 texts to family and friends and people that know him from different social circles. And he basically was like, Hey, I'm currently doing this program. I'd love to have two minutes of your time. If you could just respond back with like three words that you would use to describe me. Mm. And that was, you know, it was a little different application, maybe not as, as much depth as what we did, but it gave him like these words and it was kind of a word cloud, right? Like, well, this showed up the most frequently and this showed up the second most frequently. And when he told me what those words were, I was like, yeah, that totally is you, you know, and I see you at a deeper level, but if I only knew you, you know, casually, I would definitely say these are, you know, your in his case, like wise and humorous. And so it's again, not maybe as much depth, but it would probably be helpful for people because it's really just getting the insight and how other people see you. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's scary to ask that question. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I was going to ask. Really so, useful, so. Yeah. How do you help entrepreneurs or people in your mastermind navigate through imposter syndrome? Well, I mean, one is focusing on the proof. So, you know, the people I'm working with typically have had some level of success, right? They're not total beginners in their business. And so, We'll focus on like, you know, tell me about someone you've helped. I mean, one, one thing we do every week in our meetings is a win of the week, right? So it's starting with gratitude. That could be personal or professional. But I think just getting people ingrained in the habit of looking for the positive and being optimistic, that goes a long ways towards avoiding getting caught by imposter syndrome. So one thing I would say is like, we all have imposter syndrome, like yeah. it's never going away. You just gotta, but you can deal with it in different ways. And so part of that's just like focusing on the proof. Like I've, I've done this, I've got this result for people. I've got this credential there's education, what, whatever it is. Cause that's probably number one. And then number two would be this evolution. We just talked about like focusing not on what you lack, but like what you bring, like, no, I'm, I may not have, you know, I'm like I'm getting ready into a, like kind of a marketing partnership with a really big company. And I was like, look, guys, like I don't have a very big email list. You know, I don't have nearly the platform you've built. But what I do have is, you know, these really high quality relationships. I know that I can drive results and I have really good education I can provide your community. So it's really that would have been an easy moment for me to be like, I'm not going to talk to these people. You know, yeah. they've got a hundred thousand people on their email list, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm I feel small by comparison. But instead, I was like, you know what, that's all true. And I'm not going to hide from that. But I do have things that would enhance their community because, you know, that's my strength. And so I, I think, yeah, it's just looking for looking for the positive instead of focusing on the things you don't have is a big part of it. Yeah. Isn't mindset half the battle? Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, like just trying. Yeah. <laughs> 80% of the battle. What kind of mindset hacks or, you know, things that you do to keep yourself operating at a high level of performance because you do have several different businesses going and you're an entrepreneur. So what, what do you do to help yourself? 
I mean, the main thing I do is honestly being plugged into the communities that I run. So that, as I mentioned, that recharges my batteries on a regular basis. You know, I pray, I, I work out every day. I think there's a, a big physical component of having a positive mindset. And then the other thing I do is I take pretty quick, like corrective action. So if I'm feeling down or I'm feeling doubtful, there's an app called Voxer, which is like an audio notes app, right? So I have a couple friends slash my coach who I'll just, you know, Hey, no need to respond to this, but I want to walk. I want to talk this out for like five or 10 minutes. You can delete it, but I need someone. I just want to share this, right? Same thing with my wife. I, I can do that. But to, for me, I'm a verbal processor. And so I know like if I'm in my own head, I need to talk it out and I could be talking to myself. I believe myself voice notes. Sometimes like, it doesn't have to be received or often for me, it's more of a long prayerful walk where it's a converse, a one, you know, one way or sometimes two way. It feels like conversation with God. Like, yeah. I'm stuck with this. I'm feeling, you know, I feel in this way and I want to feel this way. So I think that being proactive about it and then very practically, there's two, two kind of like ongoing resources that I'll tap back into whenever I need them. One's called the power of positive thinking. It's a big, long audio book. It's written a long time ago by a pastor and a, a, a guy with Dr. Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, I think. And so it's not really for the content. It's just like, I can start and stop that at any point in the book. And it like hits me with like, it's, you know, the power of positive thinking. So it kind of gets me back in the positive thought loop. And then there's another one. It's, I read, the, I listen to the audio version. It's a, a little book too. It's called, it's Earl Nightingale, The Strangest Secret, which is also science and faith. It's a little 30 minute audio. Back when I was going through some major opportunities and really wanted to shift myself into abundance thinking, I listened to it literally for 30 days straight. And it's got a little... It's got a little exercise where you make a post-it card with with a, a goal and a Bible verse. And so like literally I have this sitting at my desk because mm -hmm. I show people on, on video. And so like <laughs> daily looking at that goal and then daily giving myself space and working out and, and, and you know, making sure I, I let God have the night shift and turn off my computer. So yeah. I feel like all of those are like tools in the tool belt that continue to level up my mindset. And then just being really honest when it's not there, like I'm just, man, I'm having an off day. And so, you know, what can I do? to help correct that versus just letting myself spiral downward. Yeah. I love that you said you try and course correct as fast as you can. I think that's really important and knowing yourself and knowing that you're in that space that, Hey, things are starting to go downward a little bit and then, you know, catching yourself and then realizing, you know, it's okay. I'm not at my best. And I also have the power of choice to bring myself out of, Hey, if it's not going well, I can turn this around too. You know, yep. it's, it's okay. It's not going to be perfect. So now I'm going to turn around and spiral back up, which is what you were talking about that you do through exercise, meditation, walking. What are some things that you thought would be hard about growing businesses, but turned out that it wasn't and then flip it. What's some things you thought would be easy and then wound up being more challenging for you? Hmm. That's a great question. So I'm trying to think of both at once. I can't do that. So I do one at a time. No, so you can't answer both at once anyway. What so be, what, yeah, what do you think would be easy, but wound up being more challenging? Yeah, I'd say for me, it would probably be like systems. You know, I'm an engineer, so I'm like, you know, hey, I'm going to build these businesses very systematically and scalably. Whereas in reality, what has happened in pretty much every case is like I jump in and I build the airplane as I'm flying it. And so it becomes more stressful because I don't have as much systems built. I eventually get the systems built. I'm in a major process of that now. Right. But for seven figure leap, but like seven figure leap happened before the systems were ready. Yeah, <laughs> and so, yeah. so the, the sales came faster and easier than I expected, which I guess is the second part of the question, because I found like my niche and like my people, but then what was harder is like keeping up with it. I'm like, you know, I feel, I'm going to build this gradually. And like, I'm, I'm, and then it's like, no, it's like, it happens, it seems to happen in these like big inflection points where it's fairly gradual and then 10 X leap. Right. And then something that's going okay, maybe feels a little down and then like a key relationship partnership or whatever, 10 X leap. And it's like, great. Now I, I've been like, I'm not catching my breath enough in between to like make it feel sustainable. And so I think that's it. It's like this balance of like wanting to grow and take advantage of opportunity when it's there, but also not wanting to burn myself out in the process and not having enough systems to support whatever in place. So that's timely right now because it's, I'm kind of doing another course direction where it's like, I'm hit another benchmark and I need more help. So like who, yeah. who's the, who? Yeah. I was going to ask you that. How do you deal with the 10 X leaps? 
Yeah, so a really good resource for this is there's a book called 10X is Easier Than 2X. I mentioned Dan Sullivan earlier, and uh, it's co-authored by Dr. Benjamin Hardy. So, and that's where a lot of this unique ability and this stuff comes up. And so in their definition of a 10X leap, it's not, it can be 10X like revenue. It could be, you know, that sort of thing, but it also can be 10X quality instead of like 10X quantity as an example, right? And so anyone's familiar with the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, right? So the whole premise of this 10X is easier than 2X is like, you can get 2X like linear, boring, normal growth by keep, you just do a little bit more of what you're already doing. But when, if you want to make a fundamental change, you want to make like a, a shift in the, in the line, right? So people can't see my hands if they're on the audio, but instead of linear, if you want to have exponential or even like a quantum leap in your growth, you actually have to live in your 20% and give up the 80% that's not driving those results. And that 20% is by definition, your unique ability. So like, how can I really double, triple, quadruple down into the things that I'm super effective at? And then either let go of, quit doing the other 80% or find who's another book they wrote together. is called who, not how, who can help me with the other parts so that I can focus on the things that I can drive results for in the biggest way. And so like people want 10 X leaps cause you know, the, t it's better, but like it requires massive change. And so it's also stressful, but like, and so I think, I think the, the way I'm trying to, I have dealt with this and trying to deal with it is don't let me get too far down the road before I make sure I'm, course correcting and getting the who's in place. So for me, a lot of that, like I don't have any full-time employees, but finding the right contractor help right for our call, I was talking to someone who might be a really good solution for me on like basically a software management solution, right. For, for pulling together all the things I've built. And, and that's because I, I think I, I would have at one point in my life, consider myself very systematic. I'm actually really bad at building and maintaining my own systems. So like I need a who that can come basically just like take that off my plate. And I have now the financial ability to do that. And so that's, that's the interplay, right? It's like investing versus reacting, being proactive versus, versus reactive. And so I, I would say I'm not an expert in doing it comfortably, but I've been through it a couple different times now and I, and I, I am getting better at figuring it out. So. Yeah. Do you find it hard to, like identify the 80% that you have to jettison and not do. Yes. It's yeah. sometimes this is stuff you actually enjoy, but you're not that good at it or it's, it's falsely part of your, it, well, here's the other thing. So a 10 X, a 10 X leap is actually stepping into a future version of yourself. And this gets a little woo woo, but like, so you got to think not like Dustin right now, but like if I have this goal to do something in the next year, what would Dustin, who's already achieved this goal, what would his identity be like? What would he consider most important for him to be doing? And, and, and you know, so there's a there's obviously a gap there. And so, yes, I, I it's like I, reverse engineering. It is it's reverse engineering. So, so there's the challenge of actually doing the thing. But the other challenge is what we talked about before is understand what your 20% is, you're probably not very good at identifying it. And that's why I like this, the, the unique ability exercise is so important. It's like, once you, once you both understand and accept and believe this is actually my zone of genius, this is where I really need to spend 80% of my time. Cause that's going to drive all the results, right? Like then it becomes like not only uncomfortable to continue to do the 80%, but you really, it, you, you start to really get excited because you can see the bigger vision and you can see what the 10 X leap would do for you. And you start to desire it. And then it, to me, that then drives the action. Now people who probably do this the right way are probably like putting the pieces in place and then leaping. I tend to like leap. I don't know. Leap. I mean, is there really a right way or a wrong way? I guess you could accelerate it, but huh? I don't think there's is a right it? and wrong way. I guess no, I'm, I don't I think so. Kind of, it, tongue in cheek saying like, I tend yeah. to like get pulled into these leaps and then be like, Oh crap. Like <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what just happened? And I like, I need to go like put the pieces back in to feel comfortable again in the, in the new place. So, yeah. But you know what though? I want, I want you to be encouraged. Yes. All that stuff looks like it's all pieces and you jumped right into it. But the point is you figure it out. Yes. You know, you just, everything's figure outable, right? The experiment, right? They're all small bets. They're yeah. all small experiments. Yeah. And that, I feel like sometimes when, when you hear the word entrepreneur, at least my brain anyway, goes to solopreneur, you're out there on an island all by yourself. You mentioned the word belief in what you were talking about. 
Mm-hmm. Talk about believing in yourself. And if you have any, you know, ex- examples or experiences where lack of belief caused something versus having belief in what you do. Yes, another another deep question, but I would say I love, I'm sorry. I love going into no, the weeds. I, I love it too. It's just <laughs> I try to hold my verbal processing back from going on and on. But I would say, like for me, belief is a really interesting word because it kind of ties to proof or evidence, right? And so again, having an engineering background and kind of that scientific background where, you know, like for it to be real, you have to show me the proof. Well, once you have the proof, it's easy to believe, or it's not easy, it's easier to believe, right? But like before you've created the outcome, it's hard to believe you can do it. So that at least that's been my experience. So like, practically speaking, I would say like, you know, I got into podcast guesting to sell snack sticks. I had a belief that like this would work because I saw other people doing it. So I think modeling is a big part of it. It's like they're doing it. I bet I could do it for my thing. And it, if I do it right, I bet I can make it work. I had full belief in that. The first person ever reached out to me and said, hey, I heard you on this podcast. Can you show me how to get on podcasts and, and make money with it? I'm like, I don't know. You know I never I like I did it for myself, but I'm not sure I have the ability to teach it. And so I didn't charge them very much money, but I felt like I, d- I did charge them money. So I'm like, and I told them like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I will work with you and let's see what happens. Right. And so that built belief though, because then they did get a result. And then the next person and the next person, and I ended up doing 20 of those one-on-one coaching engagements for increasing amounts of, of revenue. And I start to really build belief. I'm like, I'm good at coaching. This system works. If they show up and do the work, like they'll get a result, but that took a year. <laughs> and then yeah. you know, I was in a mastermind group and I was like, started to open my eyes into like, well, what if I led something like this? And I'm like, I could never do that. You know, like I didn't have the belief, but I had someone in the mastermind group I was in, I had two different people tell me like as a peer to peer member, like you're really insightful. Like you're really good at like, like you're good at this, even though you're not the leader. I like, I, I feel comfortable with you. I, I feel really connected to you. You're really good at it. Yeah. You know, whatever that built some belief. So I think modeling other people, then having peer to peer feedback. And then once you actually drive the result for a client, if, you know, if that's your business model or you sell the product or whatever you do, then the belief really starts to grow because like, well, now it's actually happening. And so now I've got 75 people that have graduated my program and all give me, you know, no negative feedback, many video testimonials. Like I have a lot of belief in this program. Like it's, yeah. I've got a guarantee now with it. Like I could, and I would never have a guarantee the first, the first go, because I was like, I think it'll work, but I'm, a, I try to be a very transparent and open person. So, but now I'm like, let, tell me a little bit about you. Okay. Yes. Like this a thousand percent will work. There's a complete ROI guarantee, yeah. which is a great place to be in business because now I kind of have an irresistible offer for the right, offer, right, right. Well, right it's people. and it also goes along with success leaves clues. But you know, we can't be successful if we don't try and we don't put the first one out there True. and then the next one and the next one. And I'm glad you put a time frame in there be for a year. Like it took you a year to build this up and Sometimes we think, oh, you know, I, I should be an overnight success overnight. Yeah. And it was a year my... for the one-on-one coaching. And then it's been, yeah. then it was like nine months to have the nine courage to launch the mastermind. Then I've been doing that for 18 months. So overall mm-hmm. it's been like three years, but. Well, uh, my favorite quote, my ultimate, one of my favorite quotes is it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I started, I did my first digital marketing in 2009. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's a long time ago, especially in internet, <laughs> in internet years, it's what, 15 years. So 15 years, I've at least been dabbling in like marketing and digital marketing. And yeah, so it's it you know, a lot different no back could, then. <laughs> there's no way I could do what I do now had I not started, you know, like you just yeah. said, and, and tried something for the first time. So, yeah, yeah, go out there and try it. And I think also there's this idea out there that you don't want to fail at something mm-hmm. and like failure is just another opportunity to learn. It's not a yeah. failure. I don't even like the word failure anymore. You know, we're either learning or we're winning. And I agree. And, yeah. And, I think yeah. the only failure to be cautious of is a fatal failure. Right. And that right. there aren't many of those though. That's like the whole idea. There's, these aren't permanent decisions. Like, I, and, and that's just the practice to me. That's the responsible way to approach things. But you know, like you said, what, what's the worst case and realistically, What's the worst case? Like if that actually happened, what would 
what would we do? Like, it's not yeah. probably going to kill us, right? Now, there are fatal flaws. I mean, you can make, yeah. jump off a cliff and <laughs> there are consequences. But I think, yeah, in most of like business context, yeah, I would agree. There's really not, it's not failures. It's just experiments yeah. and, and learnings. And then surrounding yourself with people who are where you want to be accelerates the process and then also helps you not to make some of those errors. Yes. You know, and, and even if you have a community with you as well, you're still going to make your own mistakes because everybody's unique anyway. I, I mean, even if you put 10 people who are trying to build the same thing on their own, you're going to have 10 slightly different outcomes. Oh, yeah. At yeah. the end. Every, you know. every, yeah, every everyone's unique. Right. And so, right. and the way I, the way I work is I actually choose like every mastermind group. I have those 90 day programs, like everyone in there does a different thing. So they're in a different industry. They do a different service or a coach or whatever. There could be a health coach, a marriage coach, an email marketer, a uh, business consultant. And so of course they're going to have very different versions of what we build together because they have different business models in some cases. But what's really awesome about that is there's so much creative energy because they all see the world differently and they've all been trained to see like offers in a certain way or sales funnels in a certain way. And then like you cross pollinate these industries. It's really powerful. That's probably like, that's, I think that's one of the secrets to why this has worked so well is mm -hmm. I don't, I, I, it's harder to market, but I purposely stay out of pigeonholing it myself into one industry. So if I did podcast guesting only for e-commerce stores, like that's easy to market. But if I have one e-commerce and one, you know, of this and one of that, that's harder to market because I don't stand in one marketplace and talk to one group of people. But the experience is so much more rich when they come in that mm -hmm. it's worth it. So yeah, what? Well, but you're also really skilled at that too, because as we've been talking, and I've been listening to the common thread in a lot of what you do is it's really problem solving at the end of the day, and it doesn't really matter what the industry is. And I can kind of tell that being in different buckets actually excites you, and it keeps it keeps you from getting bored. Yes. I mean, I know it would be yeah. for me too. I would rather find the common thread of everything rather than trying to do the same thing over and over and over again. So I think that's the beauty of what you built. And it also gives you the, the ability to help anybody who walks in the room rather yeah. than just being specialized. Yeah. So instead of, instead of me having to go build a different business every year to stay interested, I just get to help people with all different types of businesses in the way that I like to help. And that, right. yeah, I think you, you and that's really, nailed it. Yeah. So. And that's really cool too, because, and, and it shows that what you've built does have a common thread that would be applicable across all different types of businesses. So I think yeah, that's really I can neat. see myself, you know, right now I'm working with entrepreneurs, mostly solopreneurs, you know, with some level of success and they're, and, but I could, I, I want to continue to serve that market. I find it extremely interesting and, and energizing, but I could certainly take the same knowledge and go do consulting at a corporation. Like yeah. I can see the through line there, even though it's a completely and you may different do, market. And you may do that someday. You yeah, know? And, and, and be that's... interested in that. There's a, I'm a story brand guide. There's a book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And I've, you know, so I've been around him. And what's really interesting is like, he built this whole certification program aimed at entrepreneurs and then when you hear him talk, he's like, he'll throw in, he's like, yeah, you know, they flew me out. I was consulting on this presidential campaign about, you know, their storytelling or whatever, their tagline or whatever. I'm just like, that's really cool. Like he built the core thing. He still like stands for that. And, but like he can go do like this kind of one-off special projects because he's built the, the business to mm -hmm. fuel that and the credibility, obviously the status to do that. And I'm like, I could do that. Like that, I think that would be really yeah. fun. Nothing because, is permanent. Yeah, exactly. And I think when you talk to people who have been in the entrepreneurial space for decades, like decades, and then you take their story and then you watch the progression of it, they really stay in the same spot. Yeah. You know, there's always a common thread. Well, as we wrap up, I, I like to ask all my guests the same three questions. We already hit the first one, book a resource, gap in the game. We mentioned 10X. We had a couple other ones. Yeah, there. there's, a, there's a trilogy that I would recommend. It's the Dan okay. Sullivan, Ben Harley trilogy. So we mentioned 10X is easier than 2X. That's actually the newest one. You can read them in mm -hmm. any order though. Who Not How is the other one we mentioned. And then the gap in the gain. The gap in the gain is basically this idea of you should measure progress backwards, not forwards, because the mm -hmm. forward horizon line, you never catch it. So I love those three books. I just read them. I discovered the whole thing in like the last year. And yeah. I highly recommend people listen to the audio books because in the audio books, you get Dan Sullivan, who's like an 80 year old, just wealth of knowledge. They just kind of 
talk about the, the, the chapter and he has all these like amazing rich stories. And just to me, it's like Ben Hardy teaches it like a college professor. And then you get like the homegrown version from Dan Sullivan himself. And I think the audiobooks are amazing. They're great. I've read all three too. They're fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, and you know, you find you actually have to go back to them from yeah. time to time because sometimes you wind up living in the gap and you don't realize it that you're there and it's like, Oh damn, I was in the gap again. You know, I got to get out of there to, to get into the gain. And then the 10 X is easier than two X blew my mind when yeah. I read it the first time. And now that I'm on this journey, it's like, you just reminded me actually through our conversation, I probably should pick that up and at least read the highlights to remind myself what it was that was in there in the first place. Yeah. They're what, deep cuts, so. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are, they are. What, what's one question or topic that you wish I would have asked about and how would you have answered the question or expanded on the topic? Oh man, we, we definitely touched on it, but we didn't really go to the core of like the mastermind experience. Like what, mm. why do masterminds, what, what's it, what's it mean? How do you build an effective one and what can it do for you? Because I would say that's when I talk about building relationships, I would say getting into this world of participating in masterminds and then leading them that's been kind of the the secret weapon that really I, I was had my first exposure to that in 2022 applied it at the end of 2022 and as i mentioned then had a 10x leap in my business revenue so yeah mastermind yeah. that's it's a whole nother episode though so okay well you can come back and we'll talk about masterminds because <laughs> i'm curious about them as well and the role the community plays and what they can do for people i've been at masterminds actually i was just at one this weekend i was with seven other ladies and it was awesome and you walked away with just uh rich conversations and you, you make new friends and the connections that are there it, it's amazing and then you you get to know people better too rather than just having a one-off conversation yeah and it's you know if they're curated well and they're facilitated well you know I think having any group of people in a room is useful, but then like, you know, if you really want to get like super great results, like having obviously the right fit, I, I think it's great to have like a, a unified goal that you're looking at together. But yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you got that, got to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I have to hold myself back from being in too many, but I, I do, I do get a lot of energy from it. And it's yeah, cool. I do too. You just get so stoked for them and you and just walk away. Sometimes so like you're talking about in person and all of mine have been virtual, except for we had this one in-person experience last month and that made me want to do that more. So that's the thing with, if it's done right, it doesn't really matter what the format is, right? Well, you yeah, have the yeah. right people. So. so as we close, what is one small step that someone can do today that's going to help them change their tomorrow? I think I would text 10 of your family and friends and ask them what makes you unique. I think that, that you would, you'll get a lot of, in, you'll have unexpected insights from that. And I think it would be really fun and it will help you both personally and professionally. And it takes like 10 minutes to, to make that ask. Love it. If you need an excuse, say, I was listening to this podcast and this guy said, I need to do this today. And so that's why I'm doing it. I always let people use me as an excuse in my program. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Dustin, how can people find you? Yeah, they can go to sevenfigureleap.com slash playbook. If they're into podcast guesting, there's like a full on very valuable uh, set of tools there. They can do everything from calculate the revenue that would be generated for their business through podcast guesting, the, the email that I send to get on shows and that we give clients the templates. They can literally copy and paste that. And there's a bunch of case studies on there that are of people who have we've worked with and with kind of the before and after and what we changed in their marketing and their business strategy to fuel their growth. So yeah, so sevenfigureleap.com. So it's L E A P sevenfigureleap.com slash playbook. And they can get access to that for free. Perfect. Thanks so much for your time. This Thank has been you, awesome. Yes, Love it. Awesome. I appreciate the, the time and the, the space to think big and talk about some of these deep concepts. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I value your time with me and I seek to make every moment count. In order to make lasting change in your life, listening is usually not enough. So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, check out my website, personalcoachfinder.com and find someone who can help. Remember, life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Take small steps today and make your life awesome, friends.